Hey folks, and welcome to Typology, the show in which we explore the mystery of the human personality through the lens of the Enneagram. My name is Anthony Skinner, producer of the show, and we are ecstatic that you're with us today. We've got a real treat for you. We're talking about psychotherapist, coach, business consultant, and Enneagram guru, Beatrice Chestnut. That's right. Beatrice is a fave of ours at Typology. She is a guest on the show today, and uh, I've sat under her teaching multiple times, and what a master teacher she is, and what a beautiful human being she is as well. She, of course, authored the book, The Complete Enneagram, 27 Paths to Greater Self-Knowledge, among other books. Today, we're talking about twos, and B happens to be a two as well, so that makes this uh, episode all the more special. What do twos all share in common? We talk about that. We talk about each of the subtypes, the countertype, and the transformational path for each uh, of these subtypes. So you're going to really get a lot out of this episode today if you are a two, if you love a two, okay? If you're in conflict with a two, <laughs> listen down through this episode and bring someone with you to listen down through it with it as well. Uh, you're going to enjoy this. That's it for me, Anthony Skinner. Without any further ado, here is the host of our show, Ian Cron. My friend, Beatrice Chestnut, Enneagram guru, uh, welcome back to Typology. It's great to be here. For those of you who don't know by now, uh, Beatrice is the author of my favorite book on the Enneagram, The Complete Enneagram. The subtitle is the 27 paths to greater self-knowledge and today if you are an enneagram 2 you are going to leave here with more self-knowledge and let me tell you why because beatrice is a 2 we we are going to hear it from the right from i don't want to say the horse's mouth because that would be a little insulting but we're going to hear it direct from somebody who has the experience of being a uh, an Enneagram 2. This is going to be juicy, Anthony. Mm -hmm. Yes. This conversation is going to be juicy. Looking forward to this. B, um, you know, again, we, we've we talked about this before that, you know, signifiers, these names that we give to each type have limited use, right? Uh, mm -hmm. They don't fully capture the essence uh, of a type. They're useful, uh, sort of to hang our hats on in the beginning stages of our journey with the Enneagram. We often hear the twos referred to as the helpers or the givers, but I like the signifier that you like to use with them. What is it? Um, 
Well, none are perfect, of course, but as you know, the helper and the giver really rub me the wrong way Mm -hmm. uh, because I think they're too simplistic and they lead to a lot of stereotyping Mm -hmm. and misunderstanding of what two is really all about. And I like befriender. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. You know, I like too that you said this, uh, both of you said this the last episode where we talked about ones, but there's such a difference between stereotype and your type. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think it's important to mention. I mean, people tend to Mm -hmm. just run with that stereotype, right? Yes. And where it tends to happen in my experiences is they isolate one subtype and tend to to, uh, say it's emblematic of the whole. That's right. And it's not, right? Right. And we're going to see that as we talk about twos, right? Uh, I think that uh, Befriender is great, too, because as as a signifier, because twos are the most interpersonal number on the Enneagram, right? They they go to bed at night thinking about relationships and they wake up in the morning thinking about relationships and they break at lunch to think about relationships and uh and they and who's better at making friends than a two? Mm. Who nobody. Nobody. Nobody can make a friend like a two. All right, let's move on to maybe a couple of things that we can say in general about all twos. And B, I'm gonna rely on you a lot in this episode because you you are a two. I have some insights about it, but why don't you start us off? What can we say about twos in general? Twos in general. I would say one major thing is they are other referencing. That means Mm -hmm. their attention is really focused outside themselves uh, on what's going on with other people, how other people are feeling and what they need and what's happening out there, as opposed to uh, inside ourselves primarily. So there's often a blind spot around uh, what we need or how we feel. Uh, And so I'd say that's kind of primary. Mm. Mm. You know, we talk about passion a lot here, and um, of course, all the all twos share a passion in common, which is pride. You know, in my experience, uh, people don't pay enough attention to passion. You know what I mean? Like they they tend to go off on characteristic traits, things like that. I cannot begin to tell you, folks, how important it is for you to know your passion even to the point that you understand it somatically where you can actually where does it live in your body Mm, so that you can actually know when okay here comes that feeling and perhaps for a two it's like here comes that feeling that compulsive need to move toward the other to uh to charm to meet their needs to uh Mm. to befriend and sometimes when we're unconscious in a way that is calculated and strategic Mm. um Mm. and so i think and again unconscious right in the early stages but we want to bring it into conscious awareness we want to get that passion into conscious awareness so we can make different choices when we know it's it's taken the wheel do you, in your experience, be have you ever, uh, you know, I as as a four, I know when envy's coming up. Like I, I know where it is in my body. I know the feeling in my throat. I know, mm. I know. Okay, here it comes. Mm. Uh, you know, do I want to, do I want to keep going here? Because the last time I swung at this pitch, I missed. You know, mm. I want to make sure that I don't take a swing this time. <laughs> I think for a lot of, I think for a lot of twos, that I. When you tell them that pride is their is their passion, they kind of go, "I don't get it." Like it, it it just seems like it's hard for twos to make the connection. Is that was that your experience? Yes, it pride is a tough one to understand, uh, especially for twos at first. But I think in, in general, I think it's hard for people to get what pride is and how it operates in twos. Mm elaborate on that and we'll do more as we go along but give us an introduction on that so pride is this need to be important Mm. uh, and it's a kind of unconscious self-elevation it's a kind of puffing up it's a kind of needing to be better or more or than you are uh, now, the tricky thing about pride is there's an inflation aspect to it. It's like a puffing up of the chest. It's like ev- no one can do it without me. Like everybody needs me and everybody likes me. And if they, you know, if they don't like me, there must be something wrong with them. Um, but there's also the deflation part of it. And when I first learned my type in 1990, 
Um, I was surprised by pride. I didn't get it. And I think most twos don't get it at first. And I didn't get it because I, I thought, well, elevation, pride, arrogance, that seems like you're thinking highly of yourself, that you're thinking a lot of positive things about yourself. When really, you know, and I was in my early 20s at that point, really, I was very painfully aware of always focusing on how people didn't like me enough and I wasn't mm. good enough and all of my flaws uh, that that I was really focused on because I needed to be what I thought other people would like and I was always falling short. Mm. Uh, and so I didn't get the pride thing, but I think the, the inflation part is often much less conscious, mm. uh, much less uh, in conscious awareness for twos. Uh, and they're more aware of the deflation part or when they get hurt or feel insulted or unappreciated. Uh, and, but they're, it's harder to see the part that that is all about like, I can meet everybody's needs. I don't have any needs. You know, that's pride. You know, the part right. that says like every, you know, I can make anyone like me, like mm -hmm. who wouldn't like me? Like that assumption that everyone will like you or that you can make everyone like you or that you can, you can control other people's emotional experience. Mm. Um, that's pride. That's being more than you are because, and this is why when twos really get pride and really start working against it, uh, at first it's hard, of course, but there's a relief and a freedom that comes from like, oh, you mean everyone doesn't have to like me? You mean I don't have to be there for everyone? I don't have to be the one that's making everything happen or supporting everyone or uh, earning my earning being loved by being all things to all people. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad that you said that, uh, you know, it's hard for twos at first to recognize pride as their uh, as their passion. Um in that it's hard for them to swallow it, right? And, and in part, that mm -hmm. I think is also mm -hmm. because I think twos are perhaps on the Enneagram one of those numbers that's most criticism averse. They take criticism really hard, mm. you know? Uh, and so I'm going to tell you something right here at the outset, twos. Oftentimes people say to me at workshops, um, the Enneagram just feels so negative. It just feels like all it's doing is shining a light on all that's not right about me. Mm. Why is that the case? You know, why isn't it more like Strengths Finder? I want to leave here feeling really good about myself. And I, I want to always remind people that this is part of the gift of the Enneagram, that what it does is it reveals that which um, has been an impediment toward our becoming the highest expression of who we are. And until we look at the shadow aspect of our personality type and begin to work through and reverse its momentum in our life, mm -hmm. um, until we do that, we're not going to realize happiness mm -hmm. and we're not going to realize a feeling of peace and contentment in the world and we're not going to realize uh, our potential. And until, but, but guess what? The good news is once you can begin to observe these patterns in yourself in a in a non-evaluative non-critical way but just to to begin to identify with compassion oh this is just part of what my my habitual predictable patterns have been mm. and i can do something about it you know i'm not stuck in this old story mm. there's a new story so twos hang in there because you're going to feel more than a bunch of more than eights i can tell you uh, a little beaten up mm -hmm. as we go along but there's there's always good news at the the end of the story um b you're a two do you have a favorite story about yourself that really captures the essence of two um i'm not sure if i can think of one favorite story um, I mean, I think this isn't really a story, but I think it's an example of what we're talking about mm -hmm. in terms of pride and making everyone like you. I remember I worked at a restaurant for a long time and I loved working at this restaurant. It was fun. I loved the people I worked with. And I remember one day just all of a sudden realizing like, 
everybody here likes me. Like the waiters like me, the bus boys like me, the kitchen people like me, the bartenders like me, the owner likes me, the customers like me. It's like every people, every person at every element of the system, uh, I've won them over, you know? It's like I can turn on my charm and, and make anyone like me. And I think there's that kind of element. In high school, I was friends with all the different kinds of people. Um, and so I think that's, that's sort of, a, I think, a window into the prideful aspect of mm. the whole coping strategy, which is I'll just get that person to like me. Oh, they don't like me. I'll turn on the charm a little bit and that will change. You know, So it's a kind of uh, belief uh, in your ability uh, or an overblown belief in your ability to really mm. affect the way people feel about you. Mm. Uh, and again, one of the, my favorite sayings uh, that, that I heard from a social to at one point was, uh, what people think of me is none of my business. Um, that's an important thing for twos to remember because mm -hmm. we get in the business of thinking wow. we can make everyone like us. And of course, then when someone doesn't like us, it's not only a tragedy and a big problem, but it's a failing, mm. uh, you know, and so... So I'm, I'm not sure I can think of an exact story, but if one pops up um, in my mind, I'll definitely share it as no, we go. No, I, I love the story about you in the restaurant. I, I think it's, it's emblematic of, 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 of twos. I had a two one time say to me in a near tearful voice at a workshop, I just want to be liked. You know, and I was yeah. like, well, that's pretty, that's pretty simple, uh, maybe a little bit more simple than the, the, what we could say about twos, but it's, it's pretty, it's pretty right on, right? I just want to be liked. Hey everybody. One of the lessons I've learned over the years is that not everybody benefits from a traditional 50 minute counseling session. And this is why some people can go to couples therapy or personal counseling for a long time and never really get anywhere. This is why I'm such a believer of intensive counseling and my friends at restoring the soul in Colorado created by my longtime friend, Michael Cusick to help couples or individuals experience deep change and have day blocks over one or two weeks. Now listen, if you can't wait months or years to get to the bottom of an issue or to experience breakthrough, you need to get in touch with my friend Michael and his extraordinary team of counselors at Restoring the Soul. If you're looking to get out of the rut you're in but can't wait months or years, call Restoring the Soul today for a free consultation with Michael's staff. Call 303-932-9777 and learn how their intensive counseling process can help you. As a special bonus, just for Typology listeners, make sure to visit www.restoringthesoul.com slash typology to download their PDF called Five Ways Unaddressed Trauma May Be Derailing Your Relationships. That's pretty simple, uh, maybe a little bit more simple than the, the what we could say about twos, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty right on, right? I just want to be liked. Mm. Yes. And, I, and this is why I think the core of two, and this is where the, the misunderstanding comes in, the core of two is not exactly helping and giving and, and looking for needs out there to meet. Like that is not what's on my radar. Mm. Uh, the core thing on my radar is how do I get you to feel good about me? How mm -hmm. do I get you to like me? And how can I be important and central in the lives of other people, especially the people who are important to me or who I want to be important to. Mm. Yes. I, I have a friend of mine, uh, um, a guy who's a two. He's a brilliant, brilliant therapist, by the way, as twos can, can often be. Uh, and he, he used that expression uh, that I can't feel good about me unless you feel good about me. Uh, in a conversation one time about codependency, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, then he, he said, I, I, I'm not okay. I can't feel okay unless you feel okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not okay unless you're okay, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which I think um, we could say about other types, a couple of other types as well, but I do think that twos have that kind of feeling as, as well. And I'm not okay unless I can make you feel okay. You know, uh, something to that right. effect. Anthony? I just had this thought when you just said, this is my core message. Could you, so you're self-aware and you know that now, could you translate that for someone who may not be self-aware or the two? Like, what is that, you know, how, how, what's the narrative 
for the unaware to, you know, the, the uh, core motivation, like you just said. Right, does right. That make, does the question make sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I think what tends to be really unconscious to the sort of unaware to or the person who's new to this is sort of how pride operates and how there's a sense of control or mm-hmm. an illusion of control uh, mm-hmm. of other people and making people like you. But I think what often is uh, conscious sort of from the beginning is this sense of I want people to feel good about me. Um, mm-hmm. And this is why I think there can be a focus with some some twos on helping others, being supportive, anticipating needs and being there. And, and that sort of gets all the attention in the two description. But that is an element because it's like, that's the delivery vehicle for being mm-hmm. liked, right? Mm-hmm. That's how you make it happen. Uh, and so that's why I always say, yes, helping and giving is are some strategies uh, for being liked. But it, the really the core of it is I want to create a positive connection with you. I want you to like me. I want you to think I'm valuable or helpful or important or competent uh, such that uh, I mean, the, the the thing that twos love to hear most is that we couldn't have done it without you, mm-hmm. um, is that you're indispensable. Mm-hmm. And and part of that's about being included, right? And mm-hmm. so it's like one of the things that's been really hard for me in my history is like the times when I've been excluded, oh, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. or uh, that's like really re- rejection, exclusion. So it's like, how do I get you to appreciate me, like me, approve of me. A lot of it's about approval. And again, there's this unconscious shape shifting. That part's less conscious. But but often I think twos will sort of say, yeah, I want to be liked. That's important to me. Mm. So uh, what I hear you saying, and I think, you know, in my experience with twos, it's true that uh, I can't like me unless you like me. I can't approve of me unless you approve of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't uh, feel valuable unless you value me. So, so much power gets given away. Wow. In, that yes. other, in that other referencing, so much power is given to the other mm-hmm. that the two has to reclaim for themselves, mm-hmm. right? Uh, because if your self-esteem is predicated on the approval of others, then you are moving through the world dependent in a very hungry, negative way, yeah. and perhaps willing to do things that are contrary to your own values, even mm. to win that approval or or that uh, that esteem from other people. Exactly, it's almost as if we live out there. Mm. You know, oh. when I first started doing inner work in my late twenties. It was really surprising to me to realize that I often didn't know how I was feeling Mm -hmm. and I almost never knew what I was needing. And I always would look out there for a sense of who I was or, you know, what was good about me. But here's the thing is no matter when you're focused on the outside for your sense of value or even a sense of who you are, um, Mm -hmm. there's a way that you never really get what you need because it's like you're just going for that next crack hit of approval, mm-hmm. uh, but it never really satisfies. You know, it mm-hmm. never really makes you feel good about yourself. Like you're saying, it, it, ultimately, when twos grow, it needs to be an inside job. Right. It needs to be I value myself from the inside. So it and and when I really value myself from the outside, then it doesn't really matter if you like me or not because I can still hold my value. But in the beginning. It's like you don't even know what it means to value yourself because your mm. your habit is just to kind of look for the signs out there of how am I doing? Mm. You know, like what do you think of me? What do you think? Oh, you're you're smiling at me. You're you just gave me a compliment, so I'm doing okay. Mm. Like I can feel a basic sense of security and well-being in the world if I'm okay with you. Mm. And you can uh, realize a sense of identity apart from the input of, of other people, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think twos, threes, and fours all wrestle with uh, I- issues around identity. Who would I be if I did not have your approval? Who, who would I be if you did not validate me with uh, your esteem of, of w- who I am, mm-hmm. etc.? And so this is part of the twos realizing their own identity apart from gleaning it through relationship, to other people 
And I think that's a part of the journey for, for twos as well. Let's talk about the subtypes of twos. I am, as you know, as a fan of yours, I think you are the the best voice, the best teacher on, on subtypes. Uh, you've had a tremendous influence on, on me, and I've learned so much from you on this topic. Um, for those of you out there unfamiliar with subtypes, uh, these are, we could talk about this at length, but for our purposes, these are nuanced expressions of, three nuanced expressions of the type, okay? And it's what happens when the passion collides with the instinct, one of the three instincts, right? Uh, and it really helps us understand in many ways, for example, why two people of the same type can look so different from each other. And we're going to talk about three different expressions of twos. And I promise you, you are going to be surprised. You are going to be surprised at the different ways mm. that two express themselves. I want to start with, and be one of these days, let's do a show on instincts together. Um, to, yeah. to to flesh this out for people. But I want to talk about the uh, the self-preservation too. I think you know something about self-preservation too, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, this is my <laughs> subtype. So yeah, I, I've lived it. And um, yeah, so this is the one of the 27 I really know from the inside. Yes, indeed. So this is the counter type. Uh, just briefly yeah. tell us what the counter type is and then let's jump into what the what self pres twos are like and what their work is. So the counter type is the idea that for each of the nine types, there are three subtypes based on the three instinctual drives, these three instinctual drives. But for each of these groups of three, there's two that kind of flow with the passion or with the type structure, with the way the type expresses itself. And one that's kind of going in the opposite direction. Uh, so it's almost like the heart is going in one way, the passion and the instinct is going in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like something's kind of oppositional going yes. on there. And, and this is why the counter type ends up looking like a not very clear version of that type. So counter types, when people don't know the subtypes, it's hard because people who are counter types get accused all the time of not, not having their typewriter, right not knowing who they are. Uh, and of course, the subtypes are important in part because some types you can't be described just by what's often commonly known about the nine types alone. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So self pres twos. Let, let's describe those a little bit together. And it's funny, even when I start to talk about the two subtypes, I notice I'm a little bit afraid because I know I'm going to injure the pride of the twos who are listening. Right. It's hard to hear this stuff. And I, and I will say that when I first learned that I was a self-preservation two, the insight, the, the knowing of this did not come easily. So mm. I guess I might want to say, if you're not mm. relating to this or thinking this isn't you, that very first thought I heard, I had when Claudio Nerano described the self-preservation too, is it was like a thought bubble was above my head that said, oh, that's not me, mm. right? Well, it ended up being me. So the, I just want to say this may not sound that good, and sometimes you have to do a little work to get in touch with it, mm. but uh, the self-preservation too is a two that is more fearful, uh, is less trusting, uh, it's the self-preservation instinct is a little bit like, well, I need relationships more than anything. I real, There's a strong love need at the core of two. And with the self-preservation too, it's the most. It's almost mm. like it goes back to an early stage of life where you didn't mm. get enough love. Mm. So it's like this hunger for love, but this fear of being rejected or not getting the love that you want and need or not being received well by people. So there's this um, wanting to go out to people, wanting to connect with people, but this countervailing sense of, um, of being fearful of that and mm. a little bit of a sense of being of kind of arrested development in childhood. So mm. this is um, Claudio Naranjo. When he first said this, this is what I thought I didn't relate to. He said the self-preservation to is childlike in a certain way. There's a youthfulness, uh, but it's a little bit like a strategy of staying young and cute to get people to like you. So yes. it's a little bit of like, I'm going to be the young, cute, a uh, helpless, person who calls people to uh, to me to help me, to support me, to rescue me, to like me, to think I'm cute as a strategy of, uh, you know, being loved or liked. 
Hey, Anthony, you know my kids are grown, but you still have a couple at home, right? I still have a few at home. Well, let me tell you about this company who makes engaging products for kids of all ages. All right. KiwiCo creates super cool hands-on projects for kids of all ages designed to make learning about STEAM, that's an acronym, by the way, for science, technology, engineering, art, and math, designed to make learning fun. Ooh, I love this. Each crate is designed by experts and tested by kids, offering fun opportunities to learn and explore at home. Mm. KiwiCo covers a wide range of subjects from science to art to geography, and each line caters to different age groups. Ooh, I like this. For instance, my assistant has two young boys, seven and nine, and they received a science crate, which included all the materials and learning resources to build a mechanical model of the sun, the earth, and moon, <laughs> and they designed their own constellations and made a light up lantern. I love this. And they loved it. With KiwiCo's hands-on art and science projects, kids can engineer a walking robot, design a paint pendulum, conduct bubbling, chemistry, experiments, and more. This sounds like something you and I could have fun with. Totally. <laughs> and just for our Typology listeners, get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with the code Typology. That's 30% off your first month at KiwiCo. That's K-I-W-I-C-O dot com. Promo code Typology. T-Y-P-O-L-O-G-Y. You know, this makes complete sense, right? Because when there's a child in the room, mm. uh, a child doesn't for the most part, have to ask to get its needs met. People reflexively meet wow. the needs of the child, right? Yes. Optimally, uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or they anticipate the needs of the yes. child and mm -hmm. meet them yes. without the child having to say, hey, could you give me dinner? You know, could exactly. you, you know, would you give me a hug? It's like people just do it, right? So I think yes. that's part yes. of what's going on with the self-press wow. too. Yes, and here's one other element of it that is so important. And I just think Naranjo is brilliant to see this and people don't get it. People sometimes see the two as entitled hmm. of like, well, I did something for you, so you need to do something for me. But there's something more primitive and childlike in this type that's like, well, I deserve to be loved for who I am, not for what I do for you. Yeah, yeah. And that, they, yeah. you know, it's like, there's something so touching to me about that because all children do deserve to be loved just for who they are mm. without having to give you anything or do anything to make you like them. Right. Mm. So it's almost like having that unconscious wish alive in you at the core of you. Like I wow. want to be seen, but then again, but I'm fearful that you won't see me. Mm. Right. Because all heart types, but twos in their own way, really want to be seen and understood and loved and appreciated for who we essentially are. Now, again, that doesn't happen. And so the coping strategy is, okay, I've got to do something to get you to like me. And that's where the personality comes in and sort of takes over that. Oh, well, I didn't get my needs met automatically as a child. I didn't get the love that I needed and wanted. Um, so now the personality needs to act as a substitute to kind of make that happen. But of course, then you get caught up in ways where it doesn't really happen and you actually prevent it from happening uh, mm. without meaning to. And isn't that the truth with all types, right? Mm -hmm. Our strategies actually prevent us from getting what we really want, mm -hmm. right? May yes. have worked as a child. Does not work in adulthood, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yes. it, it begins to yes. become, the strategy starts to blow apart and we're in trouble at that point. I think, I, I've actually noticed with twos being, I don't know, if it, it, with one-to-one, -one, I mean, with, with self-press twos, sometimes I can spot them uh, because I've actually heard them become regressive in their language. In other words, I've heard them mm -hmm. start to speak in almost baby talk mm -hmm. in a conversation. Yes. Right. It'll be like, yes, no, you yes. know, I really, you know, and you're almost like, what are you doing? You're 40. You know, it's like, 
<laughs> right? Uh, you know, exactly. it's like exactly. You know, and and sometimes yeah. you'll even see them dress in kind of a cutesy way. You know what I mean? And you're like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. One time I was I was in my 30s and I and I had this dress and I modeled it for my good friend. And she said, oh, my God, you look like you're 12. You know? and <laughs> it was like, and, and here's a funny thing. It was a big moment in my therapy when I realized that um, my mother, who is also a self-preservation too, I all of a sudden realized that she talked baby talk a lot, oh. especially in interacting with my father. Mm-hmm. And I thought, that's weird. You know, but it was interesting that, that we, there is a kind of way of staying young. And again, this can be very unconscious. Oh yeah. So it take mm-hmm. it takes some work to see this. It did for me uh, because, for instance, self preservation twos can also create unconscious dependencies on yes. others while simultaneously thinking they're completely independent. Mm. Like I need you to approve of me. I need you to support me. I need you to you know do different things for me in order for me to feel okay. All the while thinking that I don't really need that. Mm. Right, which sometimes that dependency can make them look like sixes. And, and so unpack that a little bit. Like, like uh, what is the difference there that can help people, you know, if they're stuck between six and two, what, how can they figure that out? Yeah, self-preservation two and self-preservation six are big lookalikes. And I have a good friend who's a self-preservation six, and we once, we once compared notes and found we were very alike. But here's the mm. thing, with the two, the emphasis is more on relationship and being liked. And for the six, it's more on I'm being friendly to you so you won't attack me. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's one, one big element of it. Um, and there is another way that it's for twos, although a lot of twos have fear, it's more circumscribed. Mm. It's not, uh, it's not global. It's, it's mm. more about like afraid of being rejected, afraid of, not being approved of, afraid of losing something who's someone who's important to me, along with some sort of low-level self-pres fears, which are often about health and security, but they aren't global. Whereas for the six, the six can think of a lot of things to be fearful of. Mm. Yeah. Now let's talk about the transformational work. What's been your journey of transformation? So I never would have known this if I didn't find the subtypes and realize I was a self-preservation too, but at a per- certain point, and still today, in some ways, it's about growing up and owning mm. my power. Yes. Because there's a way that I make myself small a lot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, for instance, like writing a book or teaching or speaking in front of people, that's been really hard because I often want to push someone else out front or I want to hide or I think, well, you know, I can't do that. I'm, I don't have the authority or I, it's hard to sort of stand in my power and authority and feel good about this and kind of grow up and sort of say in a very adult way, I can take care of myself. Like I can still like get really frustrated if I can't figure something out technologically, you know, or I get a new piece of equipment and I can't, if I can't figure out how to use it in the first minute, I like, it sits on the shelf for a few months. It's like, it's like a kind of helplessness uh, that you need to kind of get over and sort of step into uh, a kind of taking responsibility because with the self press too, there's, there can be some irresponsibility and anxiety about taking care of yourself mm. where you kind of want someone else to do it. Although of course you don't ask for it. Um, so it's a little bit like taking on more responsibility to grow up, to just deal with it, uh, to not have to be liked by everyone, to grow a thicker skin because we tend to be very sensitive to being hurt. Mm. Great. All right. So much more we could say on all of this, but I think that's a good introduction to, to self pres ones. Moving on to social twos. Sometimes the word we use to describe these people is ambition. And I, I want to, uh, I'm going to spend a little time on this one because this is going to sound terrible, right? When a social two is not a self-aware, right? And uh, this is a, a, a subtype I can really struggle with. Uh, and, and I will, uh, and, and also we don't think of twos in this category very often, mm-hmm. the way that we're going to s- describe this type, uh, pride is really most clearly seen in, in this particular subtype. And, um, these are people unlike you who struggled with, you know, presenting, writing books, uh, doing all that stuff. This is not a problem for a social two, right? No. The, the, the social two, uh, they can be very strong presenters. 
They can yes. charm a room in a heartbeat, right? It, yes. uh, you know, almost, they can work a room almost like a three can, you know what I mean? In some ways, it's like, but but for different reasons, different motivations, but I'm just telling you, they can be very strong leaders. Um, they can be very, uh, they, in fact, they seek to be influencers and oftentimes seek out influencers and seduce influencers into relationship because they want to be seen as a player like the other influencer is, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. So I have to say, I have met twos, social twos, that are so much more aggressive um, and, um, y- you know, uh, you know than, than self pres twos are for sure, right? Um, assertive uh, in in trying to cultivate an image of competency, of knowledge, of being an expert on something that uh, no one else is as much of an expert as they are. On I don't want to go on too far, but that's been my experience of social twos. And when they're not smart mm-hmm. uh, or aware yet, I uh, I know that I feel like I have been the target before I think of, a, of ambitious twos and, and I have not liked it. You know, I, I just, yeah. I, I have, you, they get a hold of your contact book and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> you are done, man. Uh, because they're, yeah. they're, they, they'll get in there and go, well, who, who in this sphere that I'm now entering, can I get to know that will advance the cause that I have or mm. the strategy that I have and uh, to be liked? Uh, add on to that, B. I, I've said a lot about them. Yeah, yeah. I think this is a type that when when they're conscious and self-aware and humble, they can be amazing. Yes. You know, yes. truly generous, really powerful and influential in really positive ways. But when they're not aware and when they're not aware of their pride, and again, it's hard to be aware of the pride for all types, but especially for the social too, yes. they can be really difficult, exactly like you're saying, because they can really believe Uh, and need to believe that what they're doing is benevolent or altruistic or for Mm. everybody else and really not see how helping is a means of control Mm -hmm. uh, on how controlling they can be of other people on how strong they have the sense of like, I know what's best for you. Uh, And it can be really hard for them to um, sort of see behind the curtain of that um, and really have a, it, it can be hard for them to see that they can be manipulative and it's a blind spot for all twos but I think especially hard for social twos and and you're absolutely right they can be tough when they don't see it because they're acting from this sort of need to be involved or in control uh, in ways that um, that, that can be not so fun to be the, on the receiving end of when they're not aware of it. Yeah, and I think I love that the control, the, the emphasis you just put on control, and I'm going to add another word into that needs emphasis here is power. Mm. Uh, yeah. This social too is very concerned with power, and they want to know who has the power. They want to have power. They want to be aligned with people who have the power. And this is why sometimes they get mistyped. Can you believe it? As eights. Right. I mean, yes, they, yes, yes. I mean, that's, you would never imagine a wow. two. If you just run with the basic sort yeah. of description of twos, right. you would never put them in a category of looking like an eight, but they sure can be right. B. Oh yeah. Yeah. Social twos get, get confused with eights a lot. Uh, they can be very, very eight ish. Um, yeah. and I think also they get confused as th- with threes, uh, mm. Because they're they can be very hardworking, big time workaholics, you know. And but again, like you said, that the motive is a little bit different. Like I, I don't know for sure, but I, I see Oprah Winfrey get typed a lot as a three, and I think she's a social two. Fascinating. Um, wow. Yeah. That wow. makes sense when you see her relational style when she's interviewing people. Mm-hmm. That makes a lot more sense. Makes a lot more because yes. she has a real warmth. And and it's very mm-hmm. um you know that that warmth is very disarming, right? It, it's yes. it's it, you know in, in a way. And I think, by the way, where that other where the, the confusion with eight comes in is these people uh, are pretty lusty in a way, in the sense that um, I have partied with a social two before, and they 
<laughs> this, you know, they're, they, you know, they have a reckless kind of a quality. I, I've met some twos with a potty mouth that would shock you to death. I mean, you, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and part of it is they can suck a lot of attention in the room. And when they're not getting enough attention, you know, they, they may become the biggest partier in the room, the biggest talker in the room. The And so there's that eight-ish, you know, kind mm. of energy happening there, right? Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's something I have really seen, and and uh, they have a sometimes a bad boy, bad girl kind of quality uh, to them. You know, when they're not in front of a lot of people, that can get turned on. You know, uh, in a smaller group. Hey, Anthony. Hey, Ian. You know, I've been crushing it around the clock on my newest book, right? I know you have. Well. Part of my process is researching topics related to my content. Okay. But as you can imagine, there are tons of resources out there. So let me tell you about one of my ultimate life hacks. Oh, come on. Please tell us. Okay. It's called Blinkist. All right. If you haven't heard of it, Blinkist takes the best need to know content from over 4,000 nonfiction bestsellers and condenses it down into just 15 minutes that you can read or listen to. Mm. I like Blinkist, and I'll tell you why. Because it quickly gives me the main points of a book, which helps me evaluate which books I want to make time to read in full later, and which ones to prioritize now for the projects I'm working on at the moment. And since Blinkist works on my phone, my tablet, or a web browser, I use it anywhere, whether I'm traveling, making breakfast, working out, man, you name it. I like it. Mm -hmm. I've listened to, and I really highly recommend, Daniel Nettles' book, Personality, and Michelle Obama's book, Becoming. I love both of them. You can even read or listen to the key takeaways from the road back to you by yours truly. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that with Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books. All the books you want and all for just one, one low price. price. Yeah, so check this out. They just unveiled their new audio content format called Shortcasts. Ooh. Now you can use Blinkist's Shortcasts to quickly catch up on podcast episodes you've missed. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. They present and highlight the key learnings of a podcast episode through a specially designed audio format lasting around 15 minutes. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash typology to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off of a Blinkist premium membership. Mm. That's Blinkist, spelled B L I N K I S T Blinkist dot com slash T Y P O L O G Y to get twenty five percent off and a seven day free trial. Blinkist dot com slash typology. All right, transformational work for the social twos. What do you think? Um, a little bit similar to eights, getting more truly in touch with their vulnerability. Sometimes mm-hmm. what social twos are, do is they make a show of vulnerability in order to win more people over. Yes. Wow. Uh, like, you know, like, like maybe like, for instance, with Oprah Winfrey, like talking about her weight struggles on television as a way of being warm and relatable and, and, and part of the seduction of her being such a, you know, a person who does so much good for people in a way. Um, But I think there's this way that it's just a show, like they Mm. may not be being truly vulnerable, that there's a way that they don't allow a certain level of vulnerability. And part of that is not being tuned into their own needs. So even more than the other twos, I think social twos can really kind of feel like they're the superhuman that takes care of everybody else. And this can be sort of when they can sort of look 
truly benevolent, you know, not so obviously controlling, but really doing all this stuff for everyone else. Um, and even if it's like supporting the family, but really not putting their needs in the picture at all. And then, of course, being resentful about that. Um, so it's like putting their needs in the picture, getting in touch with their vulnerability, their frailty, mm -hmm. the fact that they maybe they don't need to be the most important person or the most important person. Uh, you know, to everybody. And so getting in touch with pride is really in the giving to get and the strategic giving yes. uh, to get something back to as a political maneuver often, like mm. becoming much more aware of that and becoming more truly humble and, and owning like how controlling you can be. Like I've met some lovely social twos. And the minute I met them, I was so like endeared to them because they're like, oh, yes, I can be so controlling. You know, mm. when they own it, when they're humble enough, and again, humility is the, the higher virtue to pride, which I think sometimes is a good way to get at what pride is, is like mm. through what humility is. Like humility is just being who you are and not needing to be more or not making yourself less, uh, not needing to be so central. And I think when, when social twos can really start uh, being more humble, it sort of naturally sort of balances out this sense of needing to be all things to all people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Learning to not be ambitious in the worst sense of the word. Mm. Right. You know? Right. And, and yeah. I, I, I also think, um, that, uh, twos, social twos have to realize that there have been times in their lives and perhaps in the present moment when they have, uh, used other people, um, yeah. in, in order to, uh, advance the cause, their own, their own self-interested cause, and that's painful, mm. but man, that's just that's just part of the work, man. Just part of the work. All right, one to one ones, one to one ones. How does pride show up for these folks? One one to one for one to one twos. I'm sorry, one to one twos. Like, yeah, one to one twos. It's a little bit like the classic seductress or seductor. Um, it's someone who is really focused on winning that one person over and turning on the charm and the sex appeal and being attractive. Uh, and there's also there's a lot of intensity and energy to it, but there's also some aggression behind it if you don't respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are the uh, the femme fatales or the dashing dance right, of, of the Enneagram. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. And uh you know, I think um, these are people who oftentimes have these incredible, intense love affairs, and they oftentimes have a one-to-one -one four thing going on, don't they? They, 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 mm -hmm. and oftentimes get mistyped as that one-to-one -one four. Am I right about that? Yeah, I would say it's not as common a mistype of some of the other ones that we've named, but it definitely happens. It definitely happens. And I think part of that is not everyone knows what a one to one four look is really like, but, uh, but yes, I think they can be, they can express more re re resentment or aggression when that loved one hasn't delivered. You know, mm. it's like, I'm going to be totally generous. I'm going to be the perfect partner. I'm going to give you everything you ever dreamt of. Uh, and, but then they kind of want you to, Give them everything they want, and and mm. when if you don't, it can be uh, it can be hard. Mm. So there, maybe one of their core fears would be undesirability. Yes, yes, mm. right. They yep. want to be desirable yeah. in the eyes of the other, right? Right. And their expectation is is if I'm attractive enough, if if I'm desirable enough, then um, you know you will meet my needs. Right, 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 right. You'll love me. You'll connect with me. You'll, you know, have this juicy relationship with me that I'm really wanting. Wow. So uh, compared to social ones, this subtype is more open about expressing their needs, right? Yes, I would say so. But, but especially to that one special person, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. probably not to everyone, you know, but, uh, and I think they may not lead with that. You know, it may lead with like kind of bringing you into the relationship. And then after they've kind of got you, then there may be more, you know, more, more of a sense of, okay, you're, you're, you're with me now. I'm special and, and, and you should meet my needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So transformational work for this too. I think for this too, it's about um, very much 
like we've said before, um, getting in touch with your value on the inside and your value not just as the perfect partner or the most appealing, attractive person, your, your value in different ways. Uh, and also spreading out your needs to different people in your life, friends, mm. you know, not just like being so kind of laser focused on uh, that one person and getting everything you need from that one person. And, uh, and so, and noticing when aggression comes up or anger comes up and noticing that as a sign to your needs aren't being met. And that's partly on you to address, you know, right. it's not just uh, on other, other people to, to address. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. So good. I, you know, I want to remind all the types here, but particularly twos who are, you know, because pride is a, is a, is a, you know, a blinder, if you will, uh, that, you know, at first when we hear our type, our first response is no, 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 no. It's just a kind of defensiveness, right? It's like, no, no, no. It's too hard to hear defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And I'm always reminding people, please um, say maybe, <laughs> maybe that's me. And then what's interesting, and this happened to me as a self press four, some things I would say, oh, no, that's definitely not me. And then three weeks later, I would do something and catch myself doing it and go, oh, my gosh, it is me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, I've been denying that forever, and there it is. I just saw it in op operation. Wow. You know, it it was really a, a a painful sort of thing to see. Okay, B, I'm gonna close up. Do you have any? You've been working with the Enneagram for over 30 years now, right? Or roughly 30 years. Yeah. All right. So, because this system is so deep and complex, and it's always revealing new things to us, right? We never mm -hmm. kind of get to the bottom of it. I would love to know, do you, have you had any new insights uh, in recent times about you or about twos in general that's like a, has been an aha for you? Well, I think there's probably a lot of them. I think one thing is how multidimensional pride can be mm. and how it often is what's behind being hurt mm. or offended. Um, and when I've had difficulties in relationship, like even lately, it's like I've had to look at a new layer of, oh, wow. Like I was really hoping to get something from that person mm. that maybe I'm just not going to get or that I, it wouldn't be good for me to get it from that particular person, right. but because there's such this outward focus and this sense of like, you know, um, it's like not, not having a larger view uh, mm. of, and, and I think the, the relief it is to be humble. Mm. Uh, it, it like, it, I never get tired of coming back to humility and going, Oh, wow. Maybe, I don't have to be that person or maybe that that relationship isn't meant to happen. And just because I told myself a story in my head about how I was going to be, you know, the person uh, that would make, you know, everything make sense for this person doesn't mean that's true. It could mean that that's my pride talking. And so mm. I think always, always being open to how pride manifests at the same time it's good not to beat yourself up for it because that yes. sends you to the mm -hmm. deflation part mm -hmm. uh but recognizing you know maybe i'm not that important and it's okay you know maybe i and also on the other side of it maybe i can assert myself and what i need and what mm -hmm. i want and push back on other people who mm -hmm. aren't okay with that with confidence. That's mm -hmm. another side of humility of saying, no, I do have this need mm -hmm. and it's okay. And if you don't like it, that's maybe your problem. Right. And I think twos have a hard time doing that because it can be like, oh, well, the answer is just to continue to make myself bad or small. Or, and that's not the answer either. Right. Uh, I always say humility is not being more than you are or less than you are. It's knowing who you are and standing in that unapologetically. Mm. Um, so I think I'm always learning new dimensions of that. And I'm also always learning how I think there are different tasks for all of us. 
at different stages of the journey. Hmm. And I think it's important to think in those terms, like if you're new to the Enneagram, if you're new to discovering that you're a two, hmm. you know, the tasks are that, you know, focus on some small steps that are mm -hmm. just about seeing the pride in what you do and not criticizing yourself for right. it and right. not needing to be completely free of pride or completely humble because that's, that's a process, you know, but later in the journey, if you're not aware of how controlling you can be, then you need to confront yourself a little bit more. Mm. It's like we need to sort of be gentle with the ego at first, but later on we need to be more a little more confrontive. You know, right. we need to be like, you know what? You really are doing that. And you need to find ways for your own good uh, to work your way out of that. You said that humility is the lens by which we can more clearly identify pride. Could you give a couple of action steps toward humility? Shh. Or I think, and, and this is especially for twos, but maybe for anyone, I think one thing is being more anonymous in the things you do, mm. like not needing to take the credit, mm. you know, doing things with nobody knowing that you did it. Mm. You know, that can be a good one. Mm -hmm. Another thing is really ask, having a practice of asking, like, is this mine to do? You know, okay. um, another thing is... Um, really being able to ask yourself, what am I needing? How am I feeling? And being with any embarrassment or hum humil humiliation that comes to you, mm -hmm. like any uncomfortable situation where you felt like you looked bad or you got rejected. It's like dwell on that in a positive way, because that is when you're feeling vulnerable wow. or humiliated or embarrassed or you are in touch humility. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's so funny, and we'll, we'll close on this. I, I in, in my own life, you know, and this directly correlates to what you're saying, just when I think I can nail my passion of envy as a four and see it, mm. the dang thing shows mm. up in a, in a new, wow. you know, uh, outfit, yes. right? It shows up in, in yes. some new iteration. It's like, oh my gosh, now it's wearing a mustache and a beard. <laughs> You're wearing a new costume. <laughs> Wait a minute, you know. I love it. I so, love the, it. The glasses that, and the that nose. That is fantastic. <laughs> I can't tell you what how wise that is because mm. the passion, by definition, is ever present if we're not enlightened. Mm. Um, and I love the way you put that. It shows up in a different outfit, like just when you see. Oh, when I do this kind of thing, that's how pride acts. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, it snuck in through the back door and it was wearing a different hat. You know? Oh, th this time it was dressed up as a kindly old woman. You know? I mean, that's great. <laughs> I absolutely absolutely well typology tribe i hope you learned if you're a two that you learned so much more about yourself today i hope if you didn't know your subtype that you identified with one of those mm -hmm. i hope that you did not listen with a defensive posture but with an open heart if you didn't go back and listen to the episode and, and see if you can mm -hmm. listen with a non-evaluative critical spirit towards yourself but to say okay well which one of these is my game okay which one's my mm. game, you know, and, and be able to work with it in a kind and, and self-compassionate way. Uh, as I like to do, Anthony, now, yes. instead of saying be yourself, everybody else is already taken. I close with this actually Buddhist benediction, which is <laughs> may you have love, may you have joy, may you have peace, may you have healing, may you have rest. Until next time. <laughs>